I'll say good evening. I'm David Alex, the Jeff Awards Program Chair. On behalf of the program committee, Alan Schwartz, Renee Dozo, and Michael Shapiro, welcome to another education program. Tonight's topic is reflections of black culture in the theater. We are excited and honored to listen to comments by panelists Lydia Diamond, Anthony Irons, and Chuck Smith. As you'll note in their biographies that we distributed earlier, these artists have a national presence. So panelists, in order to save time, I don't go through your entire resume that's all sent out. As usual, the format is as follows. Although I will ask a few questions, the panelists are encouraged to interact with each other and reflect on each other's comments with minimal interruption from me. I don't know if the panelists will always be able to see each other, but speak anyways and we'll catch up to you. I right, thank you. So here's our first question. What are some, and it's a long question, what are some specific ideas or issues that are present in many plays that reflect black culture? And which of these do non-black audience members possibly miss or not understand the importance of? Please share some general as well as specific examples of stories, themes, and characters. So we'll spend some time on this question. And uh, I see Lydia leaning forward, so Lydia, if you want to begin, I'll let you begin. No, I, uh, David, I was leaning forward because I took <laughs> off my glasses because I thought I would, everyone would be bigger and <laughs> everyone's still small. So I was like vanity or glasses. Well, objects may seem smaller than they appear. <laughs> um, that was a big question. Yes. And you can, we can divide it into two parts if you want. Do that. Say the first part again. Sure. The first part, what are some specific ideas or issues that are present in many plays that reflect black culture? Please share some general as well as specific examples of stories, themes, and characters. You know, I, I have to say, it feels weird to go before Chuck. Oh, no, 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 no. you the wife. Because I was raised that Chuck would go first. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, I'll start. Well, you're going to go so, back and forth anyway. No, no, no. I'll start. That's fine. Sure. So, you know, right now in theater, there's this moment um, that started this summer um, with the Black Lives Matter movement yeah. um, called We See, we See You, that is a critique by a uh, Black artist of the, um, the, the white theater uh, establishment at large. And it's sort of a, a list of, hey, here's how it's been here's how it can be different. Um, and one of the things that it addresses that I, that I have always found interesting in terms of like, what is a black play and uh, what do black plays talk about is a lack of diversity around what's being produced around what a black play is, right? Uh, that our plays are more than only about the mean things that white people have done to us over the years. It's more than about the lynchings that we've had to endure and the slavery that we've had to endure and the hardships in the cold urban environment and the hardships that my son is doing my something. The, um, and the hardships in the, hi, everybody, say hi. Everybody, that's, that's Baylor. Hi. Hi, Baylor. Hi, Baylor. Uh, and the hardships in the in the um, rural rural South. So what's complicated right now is that we're calling for, and what I've always been dedicated to in my work, uh, a diversity of stories that live also beyond what white people have done to us, right? Because guess what? We have full rich lives, and we have happiness and we have sorrow and we have complexity and sometimes we're neurotic and sometimes we're um you know in having a healthy family life and sometimes we're falling in love and we don't enough have not enough to date gotten to see the breadth of all of those things and so i think a black play um is a play that is like made by black people perhaps um directed by a black person, which would be great, you know, designed and produced by black people, sure. Um, but I would also say a play with black themes and those themes can be anything. 
because the other thing for me, and then I'll, st I st I'll stop because I think I'm, I'm making my answer almost as long as your question. <laughs> the other thing that I think, um, oh, what am I trying to say? The, the other thing that, um, oh, I know what I was saying. One of the things that's in this list of demands around the We See You movement is that we would like to see more of a diversity of plays. And when I first started writing plays, I was very committed to only writing contemporary works of people who you, inhabited rooms that I inhabit. And those rooms tend to be full of different classes and different races and different sexual orientations. And I have since also evolved into doing some things that do have to do with pioneers of our race and, um, and sometimes that it is set during slavery or is set during um, uh, Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm just thinking about, well, you know, what do, will all of this mean? And so the question, the answer, my answer to your question is that it's complicated. It's complicated. Ah, you made that's me not, first. That's not well, my, go ahead. Chuck, uh, go ahead. Uh, uh, Theater is supposed to be complicated, so that's that's why it is complicated. But uh, you know, uh, Lydia got into sort of a, one of the things that I'm a, I've been uh, harping on for quite a few years about the definition of black theater. What is black theater? Uh, and uh, I don't particularly uh, have a definition. Uh, but a def, uh, black theater is going to have to be defined by black theater artists in order for us to to move on. So we won't have be having the same discussion about what is a black play, uh, what constitutes black play. Uh, you know, ten years ten years down the road. You know, uh, Abena Joan Brown years ago uh, at, at ETA before she passed, she was always saying that black theater is is biased. Uh, about us, for us, and near us. Uh, so that there's a start, you know. Uh, Lydia says uh, she'd be written by one, uh, an African-American or a black, black uh, writer, black director, and black designer. You know, you can't beat that. Yeah, you know, it's part of, uh, it's part of the definition. But uh, years ago when I was at Columbia College uh, teaching uh, a class called African-American Styles, uh, one of the uh, one of my prerequisites is that uh, you know for for a good grade is that you have to you have to go and see a black play, and so I I said now here we got to we got to come up with a definition for a black play, and believe it or not, it took a whole class period to define what this class is going to use as a definition for what a black play is. And Would it be it, different every semester, Chuck? Every semester it was different. And it would, there were tears in the room when we come up with the decision head a lot of the time. So uh, I'm, just, I'm just throwing that out as to, to, to make sure that we, when you say black theater or, or black play, there is no specific definition and, and there should be. And at any given time, I, and then I'm gonna shut up because I know uh, Anthony hasn't had a chance to talk. At any given time, depending on who's talking about what defines a black play, my plays fall in different categories, you yeah. know? And, 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 I, and I have to say, I've been sometimes offended by that. Like, I'm a, it's a black play, I wrote it, you know, it's a black play. Yes. And, uh, and so I think when we start having rules about what makes a thing a thing, that too is problematic. Anthony? Unless it's what we use to figure out how to get um, traditionally black, uh, theater companies money, then it becomes very important. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm just so happy that the smart people went first. Um, you know, I I, I I thought about that question and and you know I I think I'm landing in the in the same area of you know what I think anything that we would um, try to pin down is oh well this is this is a black theme, this is a black theme, you know, you, the, the, whatever you could attribute, you know, the, the struggles, the pains, the, 
the wants, the needs, the desires. I mean, it still comes down to, you know, relationships and, and, and desires and, and objectives and something outside of yourself or inside of yourself standing in your way. And so I, I think these are things, I mean, I know that the, these are things that, you know, white audiences get, you know, that, 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 any, uh, that any person who, who struggles and, and who, who yearns, you know, um, get. So it, 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 is, it, is, it, is a, it is a complicated, um, you know, area to, to delve into and try to put your, and try to put your finger on. Well, I, I wasn't as interested in the definition of black theater as when we see plays that reflect the black experience. Mm -hmm. What, uh, there, are, there are some commonalities among the black experience that are maybe different than other experiences. Some but, are the but you same. know what, David, you yes. know what? Fewer than um, the world has let us be perceived as. Okay. You know, you, you, there is there a white experience? Not so much, you know? So yes, there are things that culturally define me you know one of them being living in a in a world that doesn't know what to do with me and always how to respect me and keep my family safe and all of that but mostly you know it's just what anthony said i i fall in love i get my heart broken i get a puppy you know i i get to play backgammon with my friend chuck i do a panel i teach a class sometimes someone i love gets sick sometimes i get sick it's the same, there's not a, you know? Well, I'm thinking of an interview that uh, the esteemed Chuck Smith had with Charles Smith and talking about the play, uh, Knock Me For A Kiss. And uh, there were two different kinds of audience responses. Chuck, you wanna talk about that? Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, that's an easy one because uh, I had the same experience with Lydia once <laughs> when we did uh, uh, Stick Fly at Congo Square years ago. But uh, when we did uh, Knock Me a Kiss at, uh, at Victory Gardens, it was, uh, it was done in front of a pre predominantly white audience. And there were uh, a couple of scenes in the play where, uh, you know, a very tense moment and you couldn't hear, there was not a word spoken nobody said anything you know and it was really 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 tense and really really absorbing nobody and there's you know you could hear a pin drop mm -hmm. now we did the same play uh, directed the same way in new york in front of a uh, pretty much an all-black audience and when we got to this tense really tense moment People started laughing. And Charles and I jumped up. What the what are these what are these people laughing at? What are they laughing at? You know, because we're not, we weren't used to it. And then we realized that's just the black experience. They're not gonna, they're not gonna sit around and keep a lot of tension inside of them. They're gonna let it out. And they let it out through laughter. Okay. Mm -hmm. Same thing happened when we were uh I don't uh, uh, Lydia probably remembers when we uh, did stick fly <laughs> Congo Square. And they were laughing at a moment, and Liddy said, "What are these people laughing at? You know, I don't get. I don't know. I don't know what they're laughing." At, Except you know? you know, Chuck, that I'm a whore for a laugh. So, <laughs> so probably it went the other way around. And I know exactly what you're saying. I had the same experience when I did. Um, well, when I had Stick Fly, no, it wasn't. It was Smart People. The the way Smart People lands at Writers Theater, which is sort of like it scares the audience. It was a comedy at True Colors in, in Atlanta. And I always think that I'm funny. Chuck will attest to that. He'll say, Diamond, that's not funny. I was like, ah, it'll be funny. They'll get a lot. It's not funny, Diamond. And I would say like 50% of the time he's, he's right. But I'm always like, well, give it two previews and then I'll cut it. So, um, so there is a thing about the cultural collective of an audience and, and how you laugh and how you respond to life and to, to a shared a shared experience. Having said that, a lot uh, you know, when I've had stick fly at all white uh, theaters, I've sometimes had 
white people afterwards say, oh my God, that was so good. That could have been my family. That could be a Jewish family. That could be an Italian family. Have you ever thought about doing it with like, no, it's a black family. It's very specifically a black family. Um, but it does show how, how, how similar we are even when we have these very specific things. You know, I, 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 I would say, you know, we, we uh, our last show was a day of absence with um, Congo Square. And I would say that when, when we did it, there was, I, I, our black audience members fell into it, loved it immediately. And, and obviously it, 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 it's a comedy, um, Douglas Turn, Turn Award. And you know, the, the black audiences from, from jump loved it. It was a riot fest. But you could tell, or I could tell that it was almost like the, the, some of the white audience members needed like permission because we come right out the gate, you know, talking about race and, and we adapted the language to make it even, you know, even more cutting and biting with, with, with terms. We didn't use the, the, the N word too much. Um, but because it is so, you know, heavy reliant on race um, uh, and, and, and using, you know, just the, um, the hypocrisy and 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 sometimes cutting edge of of, of race. Um, I, I it, it did feel like the white audience members, you know, needed to kind of look over and, and and make sure that it was, it was okay to, to laugh at these black actors in white face, making fun of themselves and and white people. Anthony, do you think that um, in our in our new world with our with our new sort of millennial um, a concerns and what am I trying to say? Would that play go? Did it go over differently in the in two thousand and twenty than it would have in two thousand and two? And was it a riskier, more dangerous play? Uh, I don't think it was riskier. In fact, I mean, some you know, obviously when it was when it was first produced it was shocking and uneasy if not unnerving for for for, for white audience members you know I, I, you know but why is you know the black members it was a it was a riot fest but for for, for white audience members it was you know probably deathly uncomfortable yeah. and then, let me interrupt and, you one second can you give a specific example from that play and then when he's done chuck can you give the example from uh knock me for a kiss that you were talking about Anthony, go ahead. Um, Can I tell you what, what, I, what I was asking? I think sure. um, I just have been feeling as though the sensitivities of audiences are sort of more sophisticated, but also more um, easily offended in some ways. Yeah, I, I think I know what exactly what you're saying, um, um, Lydia. That, there and there and, and and I agree. I think that I think you know people are in pins and needles. I think that you know for fear of being looked at with with side eyes as being a, a racist or an enabler of racist or quiet supporter, closet racist. Um, people, yeah, pe people. You, you don't want to offend anybody. You don't. You don't want to. You know, you don't want to misidentify um, anyone, and and I think, I think that there may be more um, people may be more apt to tiptoe around um, in your face hard comedy like they used to. You know, and, and movies are, are 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 the same way. I mean, stuff will get shut down or canceled, culture canceled in a in a heartbeat if you know if if it if the wind is strong enough that you know something something like blazing saddles you know for instance i mean i know this is, this is a, a theater conversation but i mean you could i i don't think something like that could even be greenlit today or it will be very very hard do you, do you think that's um does that scare you do you feel a way about it because i don't know how i feel about it does it scare me? Um, or I don't know, maybe scared isn't the word, but I um, I wonder about it. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I guess for me as an artist, and I, I, I come back to the question of why, why you produ- why, why do you want to write this? You know, what is it that you want to say? You know, and if and if you're holding true to your passion as an artist because you have something to say, then to me that stands it should stand the test of time. Yep. Chuck, can you think of that example from Knock Me, or is that too far back? No, no, it was uh, it, 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 it was at a point in the play where uh, uh, the uh, the hero in uh, uh, W. E. B. D. Du Bois's daughter, Yolanda, Yolanda. Talks, goes to her dad and tells her dad that uh, the, the her, her marriage isn't working out because her husband is, is gay. And when he and the reaction by by the father, Du Bois, is that he's so taken aback he sits down. Now in Chicago. When that happens, when he sits down, nobody, everybody's quiet and waiting for what he's, what he's, what is, what is the, what is the father's reaction going to be? When he, when he found, when uh, in New York, when we said, when he finds out uh, from Phil, Yolande that you know, say because he's gay, mm. he puts he he sits down. He's on his way down. The house goes up, mm-hmm. he laughs, you know, mm-hmm. and it's, and it's not because they didn't, you know, get it or it's not a, you know, it wasn't, it's not staged to be a comedic, comedic uh, moment, but again, it's the, it's, it's the tension of the moment right. that African Americans are not going to sit there and let, and get tensed out. And, and we're always three beats before the reveal like True. that's that's a, like that's a real thing I, I when I'm in an, when I get to be in an audience of, of like my play stick fly I can I can hear the joke land twice so you know I, I'm trying I wish I could think of one of the I wanted to say like um He's Italian, but the, that doesn't quite work. But but the the thing that's gonna land, that's gonna make the audience go, ooh, oh. The black audience had the ooh, oh, like three beats before the white audience goes, ooh, oh. And that's again about that shared cultural thing, but that's also about the way we have to navigate the world and always be seeing things as a survival mechanism. But there's that too. Yeah. Anthony, I have a question about one of the characters you portrayed, um, Stool Pigeon in King Henry II. Uh, mm-hmm. That's been described as a metaphorical figure. <laughs> what do you think about that? What's going on there? <laughs> um, metaphorical. I what know. I didn't write that. <laughs> I, I, I got you. I got you. Um, yeah, I don't know if I would describe Stool Pigeon as metaphorical. I certainly he certainly embodies the the magical realism of, of August Wilson and you know that that that's that strong spirituality thread um, that 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 exists in, in a lot of his plays and you know stool pigeon because in 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 um, in Headley on Esther passes away you know he I, I, he feels like he it's up to him like to carry on the legacy of of informing the black community guiding the, the black community warning the, the, the black community of um the the change in times of the end of, of, of times and you know, i mean that's why he's collecting all of these these newspapers you know it, it, he feels compelled to to archive the history you know Every, you know, he, he, he grabs a newspaper and just reads a random headline and you know, says, you, you got to know this, you got to know this. So, so every, every, everything is, is symbolic um, to, to him. It, it, it means something. But yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I would say like he, you know, he's metaphor. I mean, like all of the characters are, are, are representative in, in their own rights, but, 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 you know, but that's, that's, you know, that's true with, um, with, any play to me, I, I wouldn't single him out as as a metaphorical figure any more than I would, you know, 
um, Headley uh, or, or King, you know, being representative of redemption or 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 a, a young black man, you know, wanting to stake his claim in the world and 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 create a sense of legacy for himself. So, you know, they, they certainly all have their um, their their roles in in um, in in the story. Well, sort of like, is Willie Loman metaphorical? Like, it's brilliant writing and about, I, I, I don't know. Okay. Well, I, 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 I can say that uh, I could, uh, you could call it, you know, someone might have never experienced uh, a stool pigeon, then you can say that it's a, it's a metaphor. I, I know stool pigeon. I mean, I've seen stool pigeon. I grew up in the hood, you know, from day one. And I've been, I've seen stool pigeons, you know. Well, and see, isn't that sort of at the crux of the conversation that you're you're having with us, David? Yes, thank you. Right? So it's only metaphorical because we don't get to see it enough. Mm -hmm. And because um, the audiences are not diverse enough, like in, in an ideal world, wouldn't it be great if for 50% of the audience, at least, they knew Stool Pigeon? And right. then the conversation in the lobby could be, is he metaphorical? And it would be, no, he's my uncle, you know? And this yeah. is what I was aiming for. Right. So thank you. Right. So uh, Chuck, now that I have you on the phone, uh, smart people, you said at one time that Ginny was your favorite character. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, uh, she, she why, why, is, why is she your favorite character in, in, in the play because I knew her so well because I know Lydia so well. Okay, and, and the people who uh, 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 as soon as that woman opens her mouth, I say, Oh, I know who that is. That's so and so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, 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 that's so and so. Yeah. You just and, say that because she shops, <laughs> <laughs> but she, she's plus, she's an actress, right. No, that's Valerie. Yeah. Jenny is the Asian American woman. Right. Oh, oh, oh. And, I, and honestly, this is the first time I'm hearing that she's your favorite oh, character. Well, oh, okay. the, he right. also said that when he hears Valerie, he hears the playwright. Well, I will say, it's interesting you say that. Yeah, I think that I'm pretty, pretty equally Valerie and Jenny. Well, okay, Jenny, by, by far, I, I, get, I get what you're saying now. I, I, I sort of misunderstood. Yeah. Jenny, because I spent many, many years of my military days overseas in Japan. Right. And I know Jenny well, you know, and, uh, and, and, where, and where she comes from, you know. So uh, uh, I dated many Jennies, let's put it that way. Oh, yeah. my. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to jump back to uh, Anthony. Uh, play I saw a long time ago, Hobo King. Mm -hmm. Remember Hobo King? Uh, oh, yes, I do. Yeah. You know, we still have homeless people now. Um, can you talk about Hobo King a little bit? Not everybody has seen that. Sure. Hobo King is a play written by Javon Johnson, one of Congo Square's uh, founding ensemble members, and. When he talks about it, the, the impetus for it came about when he uh, heard um, a news segment on the radio, I believe, where a homeless guy was shot by a, a police officer. Mm -hmm. and, and the question popped into his head, several questions. One, one was, um, does, this, does this person you know, what is this, what might this person's story have been? And another one was who this person apparently had no um, relatives or, or friends or family. So who, who's going to be the voice for this person? Who, who, you know, who is going to, who's going to speak for, um, for this person whose life is now snatched away? And Shortly after that, he, he, he penned Hobo King. And so the play Hobo King starts off with sort of a, um, a musical pantomime showing um, a, a homeless person getting, getting killed, uh, Lazy Boy, I think was the character's name. 
And, and so the play thereafter ends up being like a carrying call for the homeless community because they now feel threatened because the city is cracking down on, on homeless shelters and you know, they're dispersing homeless camps. And so they feel threatened more than ever and they decide rather than cowarding and or dispersing, they decide to band together as a family, as a community and stand up for themselves to protect themselves and actually galvanize, mobilize and march onto city hall demanding rights you know, to, to exist in, in, in the community. So, so that's, that's Hobo King. Sounds like it could be done today. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, th those themes certainly of um, coming together, standing mm -hmm. up for yourself when, when you feel like no one else will or, 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 or wants to, I mean, certainly, certainly resonates for today. I mean, it's one of the reasons why I was attracted to it, to direct. I mean, I, I just, I love plays that, you know, that where, where, where fighting for freedom and justice is a strong thread, you know, where you literally see characters, um, you know, facing seemingly insurmountable authoritarian um, rule or, 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 or law and, you know, yeah. claiming their own, trying to desperately claim their own, their own destiny. Lydia, I wonder if you could comment on uh, an interview you had a while ago at Writers about your work and perhaps give some examples from your work. Uh, you said, my work, is, my work is about work, class and gender, and the specificities of that nuances of how different classes in the Black community interact with each other. In other words, the nuance of class conflict. Um, and I believe that was for smart people, but for your other plays, can you uh, expand on that a little bit for us? It may even have been um, stick fly because in stick, oh, stick fly, fly in the time I, stick no, fly. it could be anything because that okay. is where that is where I live. I find that fascinating, hmm. and um, but in stick fly, I quite purposely wanted every class sort of represented in that house and the ecosystem therein, and really, it just goes back. Well, it's two things. Um, I like to write about things that we don't know how to talk about. And I feel like maybe even more than race, we don't talk about class in our culture. It's such a taboo and it makes everyone feel vulnerable or guilty or whatever they feel. And so that interests me, it feels dangerous and it feels important to have talked about and not enough. And, um, I don't know what else I, I, I say the question again, David. I'm sorry. I get okay, no problem. You just it was the comments you made in the interview about how your work deals with work, class, gender, and how different classes in the black community interact with each other. Right. And I think that kind of goes back to what we were saying right. about class period and in and, right. and, and, and everyone, we just don't do we just don't do class. But I think within the black community, <laughs> at least my experience has been that we're very cognizant of class. Um, and it's that thing again about being able to put on stage the nuances of a culture that sort of has been sometimes painted in very broad strokes. So I, I think sometimes there's been an assumption that all that the black experience is, is, is one, one thing, you know? Right. And so we know from Lorraine Hansberry that, and you know, we know that there's a spectrum of uh, of financial realities and and people, and we still are black. Could the con and this this question's for everybody? Could the conversations that happen in smart people could those take place today? The moment that we're yes, in? Uh, uh, you know what I, I just saw the. Um, virtual read of, of smart people. I don't remember the name of the theater company. I apologize hmm. um, that that did it. Um, I have to look it up. Right. But um, the conversation between Jenny and Brian, where where where, where Brian is, is, I think that's the character's name. He, he's yeah. trying to, to convince her that 
if if he can just expose racism uh, or the, the inclination of uh, of racism, then then that will be like the launching pad to progressing and you know, to making progress towards perhaps, uh, if not ending it, at least you know starting uh, a, a serious conversation about. Doesn't the, he say racism is in the blood? He, yeah, he, he he basically he, he almost flips the argument that you know like black people are 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 are, are um how you say it? you you just you just prone to, to violence so mm-hmm. so he just he kind of argues and and Lydia please please correct me if, no if I'm, I'm sitting here geeking out on that that Anthony Irons is talking about my play <laughs> like <laughs> like you've seen it yeah well, That's well crazy. <laughs> That makes me so happy, and yes, well, it is. It's, it's it's a it's, it's a brilliant piece, and it's a and it's a brilliant argument, and and I've never so so so, so Brian was basically saying, you know, I I I'm the, doing this study. The white person, yeah. The, the white, yeah. Brian is white. He's saying I've got this study, and I am proving scientifically with empirical evidence that white people are prone to racism, and 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 this is why. And then, and, and he, right, he tells it to all the characters. Cars to say biologically and neurologically racist. Yeah, it's 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 in the it's in the inner workings. And Jenny, she comes back and and she's like, not that she doesn't care, but she's like, you know what? It doesn't matter. Racism is here. It's not going anywhere. I just want to help people navigate. I just want to help my I just want to help my culture navigate it. You know exposing it you know it is not going to to change it's not going to do anything we we need resources so that we can navigate it and, and i've just I've, I've never quite heard that argument in a play like that and, and i and i found it incredibly um engaging and well, then the black character um jackson who's who's a, 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 a you know a, a, a surgeon, a surgical intern, Baylor, a surgical intern. Um, his thing is that can be that actually might not help us at all. That might be damning. Like as soon as you say white people are biologically racist, then what if white people can be like, yeah, I told, you. yeah, we are. Oh, there it is. Yes, we are, and 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 that we will be, um, and. So, yeah. So I, I think to uh, address your your question, David, I mean these these conversations, these discussions, these arguments, certainly, I mean, y- you can rip it off the page, and 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 it certainly applies to you know just the environment, the landscape that we are in right now, the day, the moment, the hour that we're you know that, that we're going through right. How do we address it? Should we they address still, it? Yeah. And they still want to be in the historical context in which they were written. Like, I, it's hard to, exp- I'm always trying to explain to young people, no, you don't have to do smart people, the 2021 version. It's saying everything we need it to say now is very specific to when it was saying it because it's right before Obama, right? She's, they're fighting to get Obama in, in a world that we never thought would look like this. And we never thought would look like 10 years, eight years before this. And, um, and that feels important, you know, like, just like with stick fly, stick fly, um, it wants to be before Obama, because there's no way in hell people would be in that house not talking about Obama. Um, You know, so I, I think I think smart people is is more relevant, and still is a is a, a period piece. Before I move on to Chuck, I just want to mention for the record, somebody texted me that uh, it was American Players Theater that uh, did that reading. Okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. I didn't know about uh, Chuck. It. Can you comment on some of the August Wilson plays you worked on, especially your conversations with August, and uh, if he were here today, well, how would he chime in? Do you think? Oh, he would say, I have seen every Lydia Diamond play (laughs) and she's a genius, a genius. Okay, I'm sorry. I wouldn't doubt that, Lydia. I really don't. No, (laughs) go ahead. Uh, uh, I first 
actually worked with August Wilson in 1997 mm -hmm. when I did my production of uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom at the Goodman. Uh, and uh, August Wilson came uh, for the pre uh, right before to the first dress rehearsal, and he stayed until till after it, after we opened. And fortunately, Goodman has a nice long preview period, two weekends, and all uh, and all the time, you know, uh, he was there. He was he was there working with me and, and polishing up the show. Now that's when I got to know him because we uh, we were together just about every day. And spent a lot of time together because I was I would I would pick him up and take him around the South Side, take him to the uh, uh, back in the '90s. We had uh, on the South Side we had Isolas and Gladys's and Army and Lou's, all all those places. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we had a good time eating and talking and just you know, uh, I took him to uh, showed him on took him to uh, 39th and uh, King Drive, which is a uh, uh, mentioned in uh, *Raising in the Sun*, where Walter Lee says, "I, I, when you've been all day, I was on 39th and South Park watching the Negroes go by." I showed. I said, "This is right. This is the way he watched the Negroes go by, right here. You know, all that kind of stuff like that." So we got to, you know, uh, we got to know each other, and uh, the play itself. Uh, I was really focusing on uh, on. Uh, a lot of the music because all the all the production I had seen that up and just again this is ninety this is this is quite a few years ago this is ninety seven, but uh, the plays I uh, the productions I had seen all whenever uh, the band got to playing the music in the band rooms you could tell they weren't playing the instruments and that kind of blew it for me in terms of acting wise you know in terms of believability, so I wanted actors who could play the instruments so that who could get through. Uh, uh, a song. So I had, you know, Ernest Perry, Ernest Perry on trombone, Tim Rose on piano, Harry, Link, Harry Lennox on trumpet, and, uh, and Percy Little on bass. And they all of them knew those instruments, and we gave them music lessons so they could they could get through a tune together. So when they the music that you heard on stage was live, they were playing those instruments. So that that was not an issue in the play. And that was the first time I think that it had, well, it was the first time that act, that it actually happened. And it uh, it thrilled him to death because he didn't think I could do it. Because when I hear, uh, when I when I first told him you know, my idea about casting the play, he said, well, good luck. And hey, <laughs> I did it and uh, it worked. It worked quite well. Uh, uh, but uh, th that was my first experience with actually working with him and getting to know him. And then later on uh, in 2003, when uh, did uh, Jim and the Ocean, uh, Mary McClinton directed that piece. And uh, I wanted to be in the room. And uh, I said, hey, Mary, let me be your assistant director. He says, no, I got, you know, I got the, the Congo Square kids. If they're coming in, they're going to be singing. But uh, I need a dramaturg. You got, I said, I'll be the dramaturg. So I was the dramaturg for that, for that production. And so I, I actually got a chance to, uh, you know, to work with them uh, then on a one-to-one on -one basis. But those are the only two times that I've actually worked with them. And I've only, you know, a lot of people say the Goodman was the first theater company in 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 in, uh, in in the world to do all ten of the of the cycle. And a lot of people think that well, Chuck did all ten. I didn't know. I ain't did all ten. All in that first cycle, all I did was one of them, and that was Ma Rainey. But I. Uh, later on, in, in 2015, after August had passed on, I, ha I have produced all of the plays. I, I, I directed readings of the plays all over the city of Chicago uh, while I was doing, uh, to accompany my production of Two Trains Running. But we had already done Two Trains Running. That wasn't part of the first cycle, you know. But uh, uh, August Wilson, you know, we were, uh, I can't say he was he he didn't say hey I, I got to direct the play and Chuck will direct it. No, I wasn't. I we weren't that tight. Uh, uh, he was uh, that Marin McClinton was his was his go his true go to guy, you know. Uh, but a lot of times uh, uh, after Lloyd Richards, uh, sort of guided him through his first those 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 
five string of plays that Lloyd di directed uh, uh, at Yale Rep and uh, and Broadway. But uh, after that, it was it was Marion that would that he would want he would he would go to the to that was his first choice. But Marion was sick a lot, so uh, and when we did uh, uh, the world premiere of uh, Seven Guitars. Uh, he didn't really know me at the time. Uh, uh, so, you know, he, uh, we did it at the Goodman and, uh, uh, Lloyd Richards got sick. And even though I had just pretty, I, uh, got been at the Goodman about three years when that happened, uh, he went to Walter Dallas, who was, uh, uh, artistic director at a theater company in, um, uh, in Philadelphia, you know. Is there a specific one of his characters that speaks to you stronger than the others that you relate to? <laughs> uh, I mean, many, but one particular that you hear a strong voice. One of my favorite characters, believe it or not, and I'm not saying this because Anthony is here with us, <laughs> is uh, the character of Wolf in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, in, in Two Trains Running. I mean, Wolf is just a regular, one of, probably one of the, one of the guys that I know quite well. Anthony, you tore it up too. That was oh, thank ridiculous. You. Thank you. And, and that, it wasn't, there was, he's the guy that you, nobody would think about and say, oh man, that was my favorite character. I really like that dude. You know, you, cause he, all he, he's just there. He's the numbers runner. He's just doing his thing, doing, you know, nothing, nothing, you know, easy going and no, you know, in and out doing his thing. Nobody really pays any attention to him, but he's one of the, he's the kind of guy that I went to school with. Mm. He's the guy who uh, I could probably say, uh, yesterday I bought a new TV and one of my partners came over here from, a high, from high school, came over and helped me set it up. He's a wolf. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of dude, that, those are the kind of people I knew. You know, I ran with these guys. I ran with the wolves. You know. Anthony, you want to talk I, about Wolf at all? I just, I, I, you know, I, I did my best to um, to call on my my dad for for Wolf. So a lot of my dad and, and, and my dad, like a lot of you know fellows of the age, he, he was a he was a hustler. You know, he had his regular job. He worked at that. He worked at East Birmingham Bronze Foundry. You know, um, forty hours, if not more, a week. And then on weekends, he cleaned churches. He he would he would you know. Put us in the car and we would drive off some freaking where it was like a, a, a 45 minute drive we would drive this big behind church and we would just from top to bottom we would clean the bathrooms empty the waste baskets and so so, so that was like his, his weekend thing and then on the and then he would also he played golf so we had a golf course right across our street and when he wasn't playing golf or while he was playing golf he was running numbers <laughs> so um you know I, I never quite understood the whole newspaper and circling and all the symbols and stuff but my dad he was i mean that was that was his thing and so um yeah so i you know i, I that that was that was homage to to my to my pops to my dad Anthony, did you know that or did you one day in rehearsal go oh my god this is daddy like yeah i i went in i went in with with that intentionally yeah. It worked. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. It was wonderful. Yeah. Well, you've all shared some uh, personal uh, personalities of yourself. I have one final question. You've discussed special characteristics, themes, characters of plays that in some way reflect the Black experience. But these plays are plays as Lydia likes to point out, thank you. But, and they're part of the world that theater creates. What can audiences learn about themselves from our world of theater? And if you don't mind sharing, what have you learned from the world of theater? Mm. Mm. Um, man, I'm, I, I'm not sure if I'm answering this. It's okay. As well as could. But um, a friend on Facebook posted um, a message and said that 
if you didn't find your hustle in 2019, you don't have hustle. Mm -hmm. So, so I, I think this pandemic has revealed, encouraged, shown that you know this we we are as artists adaptable malleable you know we 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 have to change with the times in order to not just sur survive but figure it out to to ex you know express our art in in new ways in new mediums and um so you know, and, and for, for us to be primarily, you know, workers of, of, of the stage, you know, figuring out how, how to translate that, at least temporarily, in, in you know, in these new mediums, you know, I, I feel like, um, you know, that, that's, that's been um, an interesting journey. Well, for me, uh, back in the, uh, back in the 60s, uh, I, I got discharged. I, I was discharged from the Marine Corps uh, with the uh, intention of uh, I got I, I, I got home. I was in Japan and I got homesick. So uh, I said I go I'll go home for a while, hang out there for a minute, and to get out get get this out of my system. Then I'm then I'm gonna jump back in the Marines. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did. That's what I did. I, I got out. I got out. I, I got. I watched the uh, the march on Washington. Uh, the march on Washington on on a television set waiting on my discharge. I didn't know what was going on. You know, I had been I had been overseas for for a couple of years, and I was I was not into what was going on back here in the states. I was hanging out with Jenny, and uh, so uh, uh, I got. Uh, I got a job uh, working at, first I got a job working at Steel Mill, then I got a job working at the post office. And then I worked all that homesickness out. And I ran into two guys who was in a, a theater company and they talked me into being in a, in a play. And to make a long story short, I walked into the theater and I never walked out. Mm -hmm. I never got back to Jenny. I stayed here in Chicago and got in the theater. I found myself I thought I was a Marine, and it turns out I was a theater dude, you know. And Jenny's like, he said he would be back with the cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's, you know, I, uh, I never, I never, I never got, uh, uh, a lot of times I think about, well, dang, I wonder what would have happened if I had, you know, if I hadn't met those guys. So I, I wonder what would have happened if I had gone back, back, well, one thing that would have happened, I would have got hung up in Vietnam. I don't know what would have, well, I don't know what that would have been like, but uh, that would have been for sure. I would, because my whole outfit got pulled over in Vietnam and I got letters from uh, that I still feel bad about. A lot of my guys that I had talked into staying in the Marine Corps, hey man, you talked me into being staying in the Marine Corps, then you got out. What was that all about? You know, and they were up, they were dodging bullets in Vietnam and here I was on stage down at uh, Michael Reese Hospital, you know, and, and and we're working with a community theater group. So, you know, I still think about that. That's, you know, and that it doesn't give me a good feeling that I, that, uh, that you know, that, that it had, they went down that way, you know, cause I'm the one who should have been there because I'm the one, I was the lifer. I was going, I was there for, you know, for, for the, for the whole ride. So and I'm sure you learned a lot about yourself. Need, I'm sorry. We needed you here. <laughs> yeah, evidently, evidently, you know. But I'm just saying that's one. That's one of life's little twists and turns. Right. And I'm, I'm sure you learned a lot about yourself in the Marines. What did you learn about yourself in the theater? I, it, believe it or not, I I I I, I used this, a lot of the stuff in uh, that I that I learned in the Marines, and the, the, the discipline is the same. Mm -hmm. uh, being on time, doing what you're supposed to do, all that. It's, it's, all, it's all the same, pretty much all the same thing, believe it or not. You well, know? I you. Right, thank you. And Lydia, we'll give you the fine, since you had the first word, we'll give you the final word. I got choked up when uh, Chuck was talking. <laughs> I had gotten to a place in my life where I was wondering 
what is this and why do I find myself needing to, to make theater? You know, sometimes people write bad things about me in the New Yorker or the New York Times and that hurts. And sometimes I don't get the, the job or that hurts or sometimes, you know, the audience doesn't understand what I'm doing or I don't understand why the audience can't look more like my street, you know, and, and I get disillusioned. And then I, and then, you know, and then now I'm writing TV sometimes and I'm in my first class seat to LA and I'm like, this is really nice. What calls me back to the theater? Because I cannot stay away from the theater. And as Chuck was talking, I realized that it's, you know, it's the people. It's, and um, the love of a certain kind of collaboration and it's Chicago, you know, you asked me where I was and I'm always in Chicago mm -hmm. because this is where we do it best, you know? And um, yeah, it, and so what have I learned about myself in theater is that that's where I'm happy, you know? And it's, it's a shame because it takes me a long time to write a play, <laughs> but the best part of it is the only four weeks I get to be with a cast and a director in a rehearsal room. And so I think I'm missing you, Chuck. I'm just missing Chuck. Um, so I don't know that that I got, I got a, <laughs> it surprised me, but um, it's collaboration and, and the space that you share with an audience and the thing about it that is alive. And so, I agree with Anthony that it's amazing how we've adapted, but man, I just want to be in a room with people and be able to touch them and sit next to them in the theater. I want that to come back. Well, thank you. And I promised the panelists that we'd keep it to an hour and there we are. <laughs> so I do want to thank the three of you very much for giving of your time and even more so giving of yourself. And we thank you for your work and look forward to seeing it, more of it in the future live. Thank you. I, Thanks, David. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll leave, as they say, what, what do they say? Leave the, leave the, oh, leave. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you soon. All right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. And Michael, you, let, you can let the committee back on to say their thank yous if you want. Don't, don't, don't. Hey, and